Can You Feel Anything When I Do This by Robert Sheckley. Maybe my favorite cover of all time in terms of the design, the title paired with an interesting graphic illustration, rather. Uh, just sublime. Sublime. Demanded to be read before I departed this apartment and my physical book collection. Unfortunately, the contents did not live up to the cover. Um, I wasn't all that smitten with Sheckley, who has a reputation of being a funny writer, I believe. That's the impression that I've gotten, is that he's a forerunner of um, Douglas Adams, etc. He felt much less like Douglas Adams to me than like... Um, kind of a mixture of Heinlein, Kornbluth, and uh, Gordon R. Dixon. And Kornbluth is the part of that equation that kind of does win me over a little bit. There are moments of flair, of intellect, and um, cleverness that work, but he lacks Kornbluth's sense of effortlessness. I think this was my criticism of Sheckley, was that he was very effort -y. A lot of uh, moments where I could tell that he was really struggling to uh, sound authorial and to sound clever, which is never a thing that I enjoy reading. I recall a feeling of chintziness, a feeling of this creeping mediocrity masquerading as great flights of cynical genius that I found annoying. I do give him credit for being experimental in terms of his prose and the ideas in his stories. I will praise a couple of stories. My favorite one was Plague Circuit, which is the first to last about a sort of disaster capitalist time traveler syndicate that goes and sells medication to plague victims at the onset of uh, plague outbreaks that they know are going to occur. And also, um, there was one that was really bizarre. I don't remember the name of it. Pasta Toi of the chef and the waiter and the customer. Sorry if I mispronounced that. I'm not super sorry, but I am technically sorry. Um, it's a Rashomon type story told from three different perspectives of the same events occurring in a restaurant. I have no idea what the hell the point was in the end, but it was an interesting conception uh, of how different people perceive other people's motivations. There was also a pretty effective pulp type story that simply just worked mechanically and it was entertaining and interesting called The Cruel Equations, which is, I think, a play on the cold equations about a guy trying to convince a security robot that he's human. Outside of that, I found this really kind of um, forgettable. Maybe this is not his best work. Next, I read The Sparrow by Mary Doria Russell. And not to be Mr. Big, uh, big Downer Guy, but I really did not like this book either. I really didn't like it. Um, I found it to be one of the most exasperating books that I've read in science fiction. The characters are very weak. The plotting is lethargic to the point of feeling like you're watching someone sleepwalk. The themes are clumsily handled. The dialogue is very poor. Um, it's less than poor. I think it's obnoxious. Um, and even though the book carries itself with this sense of great pathos and gravity, it does not attain the level of thematic sophistication or seriousness that it wants to. Humans pick up radio signals from a nearby star that sounds like aliens, and a Jesuit mission embarks to make first contact with the aliens. Things go horribly, horribly awry. Most of the book consists of a handful of redundant literary exercises. One of them is foreshadowing the horrible thing that happens at the end of the book and foreshadowing it and foreshadowing it and foreshadowing it and foreshadowing it, doing everything short of just explicitly telling you exactly what happens until she does. 
and it's inescapable. It just happens constantly. It doesn't even really count as foreshadowing, I don't think, because it's just her kind of rattling this chain in your face. The other exercise is dialogue, is dialogue between the principal characters, of which there are many, and everybody talks in the same smarmy, quippy sitcom voice. And I don't mean to sound completely venomous, but this is like the shortcut to make me hate a book, is to make characters talk like this, like they are TV characters, or like they're trying to one-up one another with clever rejoinders. And it never ends. It never ends. That's like 80% of the dialogue, the other 20% being this hand-wringing, serious discourse on themes. Which actually, this is the thing that I will say about the book, that part works just fine. There's like a B cast of characters, the main character, and kind of this coterie of priest confidants and administrators and bosses uh, when he returns to Earth eventually and is being nursed back to health. Uh, those scenes can be quite good because they're not quippy and clever. The rest of it, however, consists of endless scenes of dinner parties. I swear to God, there must be at least five different independent dinner party scenes of the characters just getting together and riffing. And then that's all that happens. The first half of the book is this, is characters talking to each other about characters and the plot not moving forward at all. The plot moves forward in these tiny little fits and starts. She kind of spoon feeds you just enough gerbil pellets with the plot to keep you from dying. The other big wheel that is turning is a hashing out verbally of big theosophical themes. There is really one. There's one theological question at the heart of the book, and it is the most standard one, which is, if there is such a thing as a benevolent God, how and why do bad things happen in the universe? For as dark as the ending is, the majority of the rest of the book is just remarkably glib with these interstitial moments of good dialogue between the priest characters. There is a couple of exchanges, a couple of moments that were dramatically effective. Had this been a much, much shorter novel, I think it would have been just fine as a decent middle of the road world building book. Some of the world building on the alien planet that they visit is kind of cool. There's enough decent character work in there that if she trimmed out all of the yakety sack shit, it would probably work fine, but you gotta hunt and peck for it. And there's so much in here that is just bloat. I may be alone in this opinion. Uh, the other members of the Science Fiction Alliance are releasing videos that talk about the Sparrow today. So there will be links to those videos in the description. I think it's most of the Alliance members. So this may just be my take. And if you love the Sparrow, you're certainly not alone. Uh, it's a really celebrated popular book. It's not for Matt. <clears throat> the last book I'm reviewing in this video is also the last book that I will be reviewing in front of the Sci Fireplace before it gets put in storage. And I'll talk about why that's happening at the end of the video. The book is The Last Castle by Jack Vance, which lived on the Sci Fireplace for the majority of its life, the life of the Sci Fireplace, and it has last in the title. So it seemed fitting, and it's Jack Vance, and I felt like Jack Vance was the guy to close us out on the sci fireplace. This was great. Uh, it is technically a novella, not a novel. You can read it in one sitting. This packs so much into 100 pages that I, it made me feel a little bit vindicated in my level of exasperation with the Sparrow. Not to keep beating up on the Sparrow, but um, it's a good reminder of what a really sharp and gifted, practiced science fiction writer can pull off in a short amount of time. It takes place in a setting that's very similar to the dying Earth. It is the Earth far in the future when humanity has moved off of the planet, colonized other worlds, collected a menagerie of alien beings that it has recruited to be slaves. Um, 
and they live back on Earth, having recolonized it in these highly technologically advanced buildings that they call castles. It is very much science fantasy in its feeling. It also has Vance's typical cast of characters of elites that speak haughtily and are arrogant and have a strict set of orthodox beliefs that they cling to. And there's uh, a maverick afoot shaking things up, Kevin Bacon style. It's kind of the Jack Vance formula. It's a wonderful book. One of the things that I really love about Jack Vance and why I think he is a special author is that you get everything. You get humor, genuine humor that is funny. You get the beauty of the description of the setting, uh, the sense of place, also the beauty of the language. He was just a, a profoundly intelligent and learned writer who commands a vocabulary bigger than anybody that I have read in genre fiction. It's also exciting, well-plotted. It is also sophisticated, genuinely sophisticated and thoughtful, and all of his novels have some kind of a philosophical um, position. This is close in that way to The Blue Planet, which is a standalone book, as this one is, that is a an allegory that's politically specific while simultaneously being vague enough to be general. This, I am pretty sure, is an allegory for American slavery. It is also just a more general allegory for how power structures relate to uh, oppressed classes or subjugated classes and how a culture fails to respond to an imminent threat. I wasn't like moved deeply in my soul by the book, but it did it did jiggle it around a little bit. It's a serious work. If you've not read Vance, I would say this is probably a good place to start. I think most of you that watch the channel, this has been the primary focal point. I don't think that you've probably experienced Book Pilled without the Sci Fireplace. There is a life before the Sci Fireplace on the channel, but I think we've all grown pretty used to it and it'll be sad to see it go, but the trade-off for both of us is instead of a wall in my apartment that never changes, I'm going to be on the road traveling globally, going from country to country on tourist visas, working full-time as a vlogger. Uh, I have two channels, this one and Thrift, Thrift a Life is the name of it. It's about how to resell stuff online, which is actually my first channel. And if you want the full backstory and saga of this move, it's chronicled in much more detail there than it has been here. Um, basically, uh, I, I just don't want to make money reselling in the way that I've been making money. I've been self-employed for a long time selling stuff on eBay and on whatnot, as you probably noticed. Um, I don't have a real job. Uh, this is it. This is my full-time gig. So it will be much less expensive and much more fun and exciting for me to take the show on the road and travel around um, to exotic locales. At least some of the time you will be seeing hopefully beautiful beach scenes and palm trees and such, or at least nice balconies, I'm guessing. And I've invested in a shitload of expensive new electronics to make this happen. So hopefully it's gonna look even better and uh, be even more fun for all of us. I will be reading mostly on Kindle hard copy where I can find it, uh, which is gonna be a challenge in a lot of places, I think, and I'm not counting on it, and I don't know exactly where it is that I will end up. And uh, the channel is not gonna change that radically in terms of its formatting. It's gonna be even more reviews. I'm gonna have more free time to read, so you're probably gonna be seeing more of these reviews. The 100 book challenge at this point probably is pretty meaningless. Uh, the original point was to read 100 books that I own the physical books are all either getting sold off, well, by this point have gotten sold off, or are going into storage. So I think for the remainder, the 100 book challenge is, is just going to be 100 genre books before I take a break and probably read some lit fic or nonfiction. Uh, so I didn't anticipate moving out of the country before I even hit 50 books. Maybe I'll still hit 50. This was number 49. And I may have time to squeeze in another review video before I'm actually on the road. Uh, we will see. 
So everybody, pour one out for the old side fireplace. We will miss it. I will definitely miss it at least. Um, but I think uh, we're trading up. Thanks for watching. See you on the next one.